few Tasmanians visit the far northeast tip of the island. Here at Cape Portland are some fascinating relics of a bygone age when sealers, whalers, ticket of leave convicts and shepherds lived a rugged and isolated existence far from civilization. Once a region where primitive technology allowed the indigenous inhabitants to survive for thousands of years, now hosts the latest in technology, harnessing the incessant winds of the roaring forties as they sweep across the Cape. Here on a small island in the Tregaran lagoons are the last resting places of the district's pioneers, the Bowen, Groves and Terry families. After the indigenous inhabitants were shipped off to Flinders Island in the 1830s, land was sold to the Foster, Bowen and Groves families. In the 1980s, grade 10 students from Scottsdale High School visited this area as part of the survival camp, which involving it tough in the bush, just like the pioneers. <coughs> students had to navigate with map and compass to the lonely cemetery on the island. Here, some of the students discovered the graves of their ancestors. <laughs> Who was it? And what did you do? You he them started up rushing the game. Not oh. my parents, dear. I'm not dead, but sleeping here. I was not yours, but God's alone. He loved me best and took me home. George Grove Senior was transported to Van Diemen's Land in 1850 for stealing sheep. In 1874, he went to work at Red Hills property as a shepherd for Nathaniel Ellison. Members of the Groves family came to own or manage nearly 100,000 acres of land around the Cape. They owned the property known as Rushy Lagoon and built the Icena homestead. Samuel Bowen was born in Wales. He was a blacksmith by trade, but after being convicted of burglary, was sent to Van Diemen's Land for life, arriving in 1823. When the Cape Portland property was sold to the Wind Farm project, the cemetery site was cleared up as the old wooden fence had fallen down. In the early 1900s, a Mr Terry managed the property for the Fosters. In 1833, Samuel and his wife Anne acquired a 1,500-acre Tregaran property at Cape Portland, and this became the family home for over a hundred years. The family leased considerable areas of land around Cape Portland, conducting sheep farming on a large scale. Wool was shipped from nearby Westboat Harbour to markets. There are now 56 3 megawatt wind generators, producing enough electricity to power 30,000 homes.
1850s, cattle were shipped to and from the foster property at Cape Portland to Victoria. Little is known about the stone buildings out on the Cape, probably built by ticket of leave convicts for the Foster family. John Foster, the original owner, never lived here, but his brother Henry lived at the Cape and managed the property until the mid-1850s. There was a substantial establishment at the Cape by 1842, with 14 males, including seven shepherds, five gardeners and stockmen. And here we are standing where we shouldn't be because the sign says no, don't go inside, it's dangerous. Peace! Oh, that's oh, <laughs> Sheep were brought from properties at Cressy to the Cape, a journey taking 15 days. Over three and a half thousand sheep were on the property in 1870, although many of these died of liver fluke. Is that the door they used to get to? No, the door's around the other side. Because it was a three-seater. <laughs> Whether it actually was. It's pretty big though. Oh, so there is a door. Is that on? Yep. Yeah, I thought so. The way you move it about. It's pretty mm. hairy for a toilet. Yeah. How oh, come they've got galvanised roofing iron? The view from Vinegar Hill on the Cape gives panoramic views over Bank Strait to the Furno Islands, including Cape Barron and Flinders Island. It was past here that Bass and Flinders sailed in 1798, confirming Bass Strait existed and that Van Diemen's Land was an island. In 1815, James Kelly, who circumnavigated Van Diemen's Land in a whaleboat, landed near Cape Portland and conversed with a large clan of Tasmanian Aborigines. He persuaded some of the women to catch seals for him on nearby rocks. In 1831, George Augustus Robinson was in the Cape Portland area. With the aid of Manalagena, elder of the northeastern Ben Lomond tribe, he was searching for the remaining Tasmanian Aborigines in the area to take them to Flinders Island. Sealers and bay whalers had established themselves at Cape Portland and nearby Furno Islands in the early 1800s. A tripod was discovered here by a fisherman and taken to the Low Head Pilot Station. And this is in fact uh, one of the preferred way depth counting areas in, in Australia. There are certain areas set aside to be counted regularly for the next 10 years. And this is one of them, so it's obviously a very significant place. Twenty thousand kilometres to breed, and then fly twenty thousand kilometres to come back here to have a rest. Now it's got to time its flight, and it's going right now. They're on their way now. 
to land in the tundra of northern China and Siberia just as the permafrost is beginning to melt. So that if it gets there too soon, it's all frozen and there's no tucker. As soon as the frost melts, all that becomes alive with insects, so it's got loads of tucker. And, and to have a breeding bird, you've got to have lots of food, because you've got to feed your babies, haven't you? You don't feed them the dark. Right? So he's got to time that. Now, the summer in, in, the Ant in the Arctic is very short, so he's got probably three months of frenzied activity of feeding eggs, young birds, big enough to fly back before the end of that three month period. And then they can fly 20,000 K all the way back here just to sit for the rest of the summer here while they get themselves fat again. Now when they're in the summer here, they get sat down and they feed and feed and feed until they put on twice their body weight. And then they fly all the way back. So, as we leave the Cape, reflect on the significance of this largely unknown area, once a homeland of the Cape Portland Aboriginal tribe, then the busy sealing and whaling base before the earliest farming area in northeastern Tasmania with its extensive sheep runs. Now it is a combination of high-tech wind farming with new more intensive farming methods including dairying. What might the future hold for such a fascinating location on Tasmania's far northeastern corner.